The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 15, The Rule of Behavior Change. Now this chapter encompasses Law 4 of Habit Formation, Make It Satisfying. So last chapter, we talked about one of the most important strategies in this book in how to establish habits, make bad habits very difficult, and good habits really inevitable. And that's pre-commitment and implementation intentions to increase adherence. We talked about some research and science of how you can implement that. Very powerful strategy, highly recommend if you haven't seen that. Now, we're on to chapter 15 and we're, we're talking about a new uh, component of habit formation, how to make habits satisfying. So, let's get into it. Simple things like distributing soap has a positive, satisfying, sensory qualities to it. The fragrance, the consistency, can dramatically increase the adherence for washing one's hands to improve hygiene and mitigate health ailments in poor countries, okay? So, already, we're giving a rudimentary example of how we can entice people to improve their hygiene in poor or lower social economic areas by engaging their senses. Wrigley's uh, revolutionized chewing gum by adding flavor to it to make it satisfying. Before that, there was no flavor or mild flavor. After that, the use skyrocketed, skyrocketed and they became the biggest chewing gum company in the world because it had no fragrance previously, they added an engaged scent, they made it satisfying. So making a habit satisfying obviously increases the odds it will be repeated. Okay, you know that. Common sense. I don't need to watch this. Um, I know, uh, that's obvious. Well, if it was so obvious, why do you and so many people struggle with your own habits? Obviously, there's a missing component. This is not the answer, it's just an answer to how you can make your own habits more satisfying and destructive habits less satisfying. So we're now going to talk about the mismatch between immediate and delayed rewards. Many actions we take today create a delayed return. Saving money now will provide reward later in the future because now you have an abundance of money to invest in, which can then Investments in now, so you can have greater prosperity and returns in the future, in your health, in your wellness, in your financial investments, etc. Many of our actions can take months or years to get the final intended outcome and payoff. But some would say our brains have evolved to prefer quick, immediate rewards and payouts compared to long-term you know, responding to grave, immediate threats from animals or nature and the next meal. Now, I believe that our brains have evolved to prefer the quick, immediate reward and payout compared to the long term. Responding to the grave, immediate threat from animals or nature and the next meal is more favorable and more important from a basic, mechanistic, instinctual perspective. See, the distant future was less of a concern. Instant gratification was important for survival and reproduction because we have to ask ourselves, why are we like this? Why is the human machine brain wired in such a way where we can be so gluttonous and hedonistic? Why does instant gratification allure us so much? Why is it so enticing? Why do so many people get caught in addictions of gratification? I believe, and some other people believe as well, that it's because of this, or mostly because of this reward, instant gratification pathway for the, to fulfill the outcome of maximizing survival. But now, this mechanism, this instinctual evolutionary mechanism is being ex warped. It's being exposed, being warped by our the pleasures of modern life. So the consequences of destructive habits are often delayed in our current society. Eating highly processed sugary, calorically dense food, smoking is acutely gratifying and satisfying now. The rewards are immediate, but it, it won't physically necessarily destroy your health right now. It's going to take years. 
And we can go numerous examples of this. The problem is one action repeated over and over can produce multiple outcomes over time. One acute satisfying feelings feeling now and one often much later deleterious consequence later. Now, let's rephrase that in case there was too many words in that sentence perhaps. The outcomes are opposite but convergent and they're mismanaged. So from one action repeated over and over again now, one destructive action, think of one you have in your life now, we all have at least one, right? How that may produce multiple disadvantageous outcomes in the future. You see, just because you eat in a surplus of calories or you live a very highly stressful life most days of the week, doesn't mean that the outcome at the end of that in years to time, would, there would just be one outcome. In fact, particularly when we talk about the human body, there are usually, it's a multi-outcome multi uh, solution. So the consequences of your deleterious destructive behaviors will often not just affect you, but can infect the people around you, can affect multiple points of your health. We're not just talking brain inflammation or we're talking gastrointestinal, we're talking uh, like epithelial, like the uh, integumentary system, the outer layer of your skin. Like there's so many layers of your body that can be affected by one repeated decision. And the same could be said for your career, you know, quitting that job now or, you know, going to that strip club every night. There are, there are multi, there's going to be multiple outcomes as a result of that destructive behavior. So we need to consider this, that it's, it's not a linear, it's not a uni, unilateral problem, like meaning one, it's a multivariate. The more immediate the pleasure and gratification you get from an immediate action, the more you should question its future consequences and alignment to your future goals. I put this in bold. I think this is a particularly thought provoking, we think about if something gives us an immediate pleasure and gratification, that is reason, that should give us reason for caution and critical thinking about whether this action is productive and constructive for us long term. Now, whether you do it once, in, like every now and again, seldom, once a week, you know, the less frequently you engage in pleasurable, gratifying, potentially destructive behaviors, the less likely they are to have a long-term sizable effect on your life. But the question should still be asked, the pleasure and gratification of going on the roller coaster every day, of seeking alcohol and partying and drugs and addictive types of behaviors, we, you should question the consequences of that. There is no free lunch. No one gets out of this without consequences. And how does those behaviors align with your future goals? You see, the brain overestimates the danger of anything that seems like an immediate threat, but has very low likelihood of actually happening. The brain overestimates the danger of anything that seems like an immediate threat, but has a very low... Okay, so an example of this would be a terrorist attack, a car crash, a burglary while you're home, you know, aliens. Uh, very low likelihood of happening. But often we overestimate the danger. Meanwhile, it underestimates what appears to be a distant threat, but is very likely. Example being the steady accumulation of adipose tissue or fat from eating an unhealthy calorically uh, surplus diet, the, or the gradual atrophy of muscle from a sedentary lifestyle, the slow buildup of clutter when you don't clean up. We underestimate the 1% changes that can occur day in and day out while we overestimate the very rare but very large threats that can occur, the tornado, the volcano, the house catching on fire. And while it can be a good thought experiment to, to play with those scenarios in your mind to see what you would do, how you would respond, if you're spending so much of your time there, you miss out or you don't pay enough attention to the potentially immediately dangerous threats around the corner, like of the ones I've mentioned. 
what happens when you surround yourself with people who exhibit self-destructive behaviors for a long period of time. Well, you become those people. You become who you surround yourself with. What happens when you only hear one side of an argument? Well, you only really get to understand that point of view without understanding the other. So in that sense, what is immediately rewarded is repeated and what is immediately punished is avoided. What is immediately rewarded is repeated and what immediately punished is avoided. So we can use this to our advantage. Success in nearly every field requires one to ignore immediate gratification and reward in favor of the departed reward. But to get a habit to stick, you need to feel immediately successful even if it's in a small way. So ignoring and pushing aside gratification and reward is useful so you can exert discipline over doing something you need to do that you may not necessarily really want to do. But at the tail end of it, if you can, and if we can make ourselves feel like the difficult behavior can be successful, we can make it, we can give ourselves a feeling of, of success in some small way, or it can stick more. It can be rooted and established more now to root in our routine. So that's kind of the theory of it, but now how do we do it? How do we turn instant gratification to our advantage? You want the ending of your habit to be satisfying. Taking two hours to cook a meal is satisfying to most people because you get to enjoy it shortly after. Unless your reward is the process, is the actual cooking. And this is, this is particularly interesting because you start to distinguish, are you process driven or outcome driven? I would say, meet yourself where you're at. Most people would benefit from making the end of their habit satisfying. We use reinforcement to tie your habit to an immediate reward. Nothing impertinently happens during avoidance types behaviors. You just don't do the thing like don't eat the donut or don't go for drinks again. It can be hard to feel satisfied when there's just a resistance of temptation. When you just have to exert effort and discipline. What if you could work smarter? What if you didn't have to just avoid it? What if you put reinforcement at the end of it? Now this is quite basic psychological conditioning, operant conditioning type of uh, theory. Uh, but we forget about it. We don't really implement it into our own lives. Like, here's an example. How to hack avoidance habits. You want to design a way to make avoidance visible. So let's say you want to save money. Open a savings account. Whenever you pass on purchasing a non-essential good, put that money in the account. Skip your morning latte. Transfer $5.00. Don't buy those shoes, transfer $100. So now the immediate reward of seeing yourself avoid something feels a lot better than just being deprived of that thing. You're making it satisfying to abstain. That's it. How can you make abstaining satisfying? You'd be like, what are you talking about? How could I do that? Well, here's the example. You have to do something at the end of that action to reward yourself, to tell your brain this behavior is good. You put that money in the account, ding, ding. You see those numbers go up, ding, ding, dopamine hit. I'm on the right path. Your brain knows you're on the right path. You release serotonin or dopamine. That is a good sign for you to reinforce and enforce a positive habit and to make abstaining satisfying. Another example is if you're trying to save money to buy more freedom with your life, then every time you transfer that money over, reward yourself with something like walking outside or reading a book, doing something you actually want to spend your time doing, which aligns with your goal of more free time and more financial freedom. So whoever you like to value your time, 
and you're trying to save money so you can buy more time will give yourself a reward at the end of that where you like you want to do like everybody has like an ideal kind of lifestyle right get a snippet of that do a little bit of that at the end of the behavior what about to stop eating out so much you know that's an avoidance behavior rename a bank account something you want like uh, something you want maybe you want to take a trip somewhere a trip to europe maybe you want to save for a tv or save for a car or a you know a watch let's go something like maybe more of an investment um you want to buy a home or a stock or some stocks every time you you don't order the food because remember when we're trying to eat out less and you skip on getting takeout you transfer the value of what you would have ordered into that account now you've made the avoidance behavior rewarding and you're helping yourself get towards saving up for an investment that is valuable to you so we have to make avoidance habits rewarding you know, we have to make, <clears throat> if you're going to avoid eating the donut, it would be wise to replace it with something else. Replace it with a much more lower calorically, uh, much more lower calorie option that also has the same type of palatability. People don't believe this exists. It does exist. It exists in sugar alcohols. It exists in non-caloric uh, artificial sweeteners like sucralose or monk fruit or allulose. Like these sweeteners can exist in, that do exist in, in the food and uh, food manufacturing uh, environment. So we can actually, well, all right, I didn't eat the donut, but I'm going to give myself uh, instead the... the low calorie you know naturally flavored sweetened food so now you don't have some of the same consequences that you would have of the potentially you know calorically dense food but you still get something gratifying at the end of it so note you need to pick short term rewards that reinforce your identity rather than ones that conflict with it. Saving up to buy new clothing is good if you're trying to lose weight, be healthier, because that rewards ties into your physical appearance. Your reward for exercising probably shouldn't be eating ice cream if you're exercising to be healthier, to lose weight, because that reward conflicts and contradicts with your identity. Instead, the reward could be a warm bath, sauna, a massage. So that short-term reward now aligns with your long-term vision and identity of being a healthier person. You do something that aligns with your identity, something that is constructive generally to the person you're trying to become. Then something really special happens. With enough time, discipline, and smart action, you become less concerned with chasing secondary rewards because your identity has shifted and that identity itself becomes the reinforcement. Now you do X behavior because it's who you are and it feels good to you. So the more the habit becomes part of your life, the less you need external encouragement to fall through. Incentives can start the habit, but identity sustains the habit. Incentives can start the habit, but identity sustains it. And so that there is this consistent theme in this book of identity association with your habits. It is so important that you get clear on the person you are trying to become, the values that are important to you. You're trying to become healthy psychologically, physically. You're trying to become smarter. What would a smart person do? Would a smart person skip out on reading for the second day in a row? No, they absolutely would not. They would read that paper. They would read that chapter. So you incentivize yourself to read. Every time you read a book, you do a behavior, or read a book, read a chapter or read a page, you do something that is gratifying to you, but also helps fulfill your value of becoming a generally healthier person or becoming a smarter person, I should say. What a lot of smart people do, they go for walks. They 
reflect. They have time to meditate and be by themselves. Or maybe you reward yourself with a phone call with a good friend and you talk about and you naturally talk about some of these concepts you discussed. Now you can get some social engagement and you can actually become smarter by bouncing ideas off another person. There are unlimited examples, but it's very important that you can make avoidance types behaviors rewarding. If you align them with something that is important and, and aligns with your values and identity and who you're trying to become. You, it doesn't always have to be more willpower, more effort to avoid things. You can reward yourself and then ending up eventually forming a habit that aligns with your identity uh, that is sustained on of itself like rolling a ball down a hill. It Momentum just keeps going. You know, you're going to climb the hill at the start because you're going to use incentives to start the habit. But once you get that habit going, your identity will be the ball, the, 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 the uh, reducing the inertia, reducing the resistance to motion as you fall down the hill and continue to do the habit. So that summarizes, let's summarize the four laws. The first three laws of behavior change make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy. Increase the odds that a behavior will be performed in the present. That's what they do. Obvious, attractive, easy. The fourth law, make it satisfying, increases the odds that a behavior will be repeated the next time. That's why we need all four. And next video, chapter 16, we're going to go through how to stick with a good habit every day. Like once we, we've built some momentum, but we're not as consistent, what are some strategies that we can implement? to monitoring and managing the consistency of our habits because consistency beats perfection as much as many of us and many of you and even old me would procrastinate for perfection it's a trick we play on ourselves anyway i hope you guys took value from that all these are available on podcast platforms youtube facebook at alexander emmanuel on all platforms alexanderemmanuel.com you can also check out the uh, subscribe to the email newsletter if you want kind of a fail safe way to stay in contact with my content and the things I put out to the world and the podcast that I do, for example. Otherwise, thank you. I'll see you in the next one.